them for this course. And he was my professor at Laurier and uh, former, former boss at Sheridan. Amazing guy. He's currently teaching at University of Western Ontario. Amazing professor. And I'm very happy that he's uh, getting all this recognition. So we're gonna go through the fiscal policy, stabilizers, cyclically adjusted budget, then how governments, like governments that, the problems that governments will have in enacting fiscal policy, and then Canadian debt. So since 1945, World War II, fiscal policy has been one of the government's main stabilization policy tools. So, what happens is if the if fiscal policy is expansionary, the AD curve will shift out. So, so it'll shift out if fiscal policy is expansionary, government spending goes up or taxes go down. So then uh, contractionary fiscal policy is used to stop demand pull inflation. So they do that to um, decrease government spending, increase taxes. And they do this to stop inflation. So right now, like, Inflation is about, like in Canada, it's about 8%. And that's kind of what they're quoting, roughly. Um, but it's higher. Just the government manipulates it downward. But it's higher than that. Uh, they just, it, they show a lower number just for their own uh, polling. But yeah, it's higher than that. Um, but yeah, what they do to reduced inflation rate is reduced government spending, increased taxes for fiscal policy. So <clears throat> what they do, 80 curve shifts left. So they reduce government spending, increased taxes to reduce inflation. So this causes, this causes inflation to go down through government spending reduction and tax increase leading to 80 shift left and real GDP go down. Yeah. So they can if there's a recession, they can increase government spending. Uh, then uh, if, there's a, if they want to reduce the size of the government, they can decrease government spending. So net tax revenues vary directly with GDP. So taxes rise when GDP rises and vice versa. Transfer payments fall when GDP rises and vice versa. Leads to automatic stabilization over the business cycle. So with that, the like, the good explanation for taxes rises when GDP rises, let's say the average tax rate is 30%, right? So then, uh, so let's say GDP in 2010 is $1 trillion. And GDP in 2020 is $2 trillion. Uh, that would mean that the tax taxes collected in 2010 is... 1 trillion times 30%, which is 300 billion. And then taxes collected in 2020, 2 trillion times 30% is uh, 600 billion. The taxes rose by 300 billion over that time frame due to tax collected. Due to growth 
Il GDP. Yeah. So then, automatic or built in stabilizers, a structure of taxation and spending that increases deficit, reduces surplus during the recession, increases surplus, reduces deficit during inflation. So stabilizers are good because they they can help the economy get back to growth during recession. Yeah. So here, um, this would be a surplus because taxes are greater than government spending. Therefore, the government can save money. Yeah. And then a deficit is when the uh, taxes are lower than government spending. Therefore, the government is spending more than they take in. So they are, are going into debt. So, progressive taxes are when um, people get taxed at a higher rate when they are making more money. And then proportional is people get taxed at the same rate um, at all incomes. And then regressive is people get taxed at a lower rate when they make more money. So for progressive, let's say like 30% tax rate for 50,000 and under in income. And then let's say 50% tax rate for 500,000 and over in income. So it's like that for progressive. So I'll just put that in a progressive. And then proportional, for proportional, it's uh, the 30% tax rate for 50,000 and under in income. 30% tax rate for 500,000 and over in income. Yeah. And then regressive, it's basically the opposite of progressive. So 50% tax rate for 50,000 and under in income and 30% tax rate for 500,000 and over in it. So yeah. So the cyclically adjusted budget is what the budget balance will be if the economy was operating at full employment. So if, uh, if, if, so that's when, so cyclical unemployment is zero. We only have frictional unemployment and, 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 uh, structural employment. So we're operating peak in the business cycle.
So fiscal policy was uh, so neutral to mildly expansionary, expansionary in the early 1990s. So that was so like under Mulroney, he had uh, he was running deficits. So government spending was greater than taxes, tax taxes. So that was Mulroney. And then then Chen came in with and Paul Martin, the finance minister, came in and they uh, they had taxes greater than government spending, so surpluses. They saved billions for the Canadian government and reduced the debt. And Clinton did this in the U.S. too. So uh, Bill Clinton did the same in the U.S. Uh, yeah, so like a combination of the economic growth was high in the late 1990s, so they could collect more government revenue to get out of debt. Yeah. So then in 2009, expansionary fiscal policy so under Harper, he, he ran deficits, government spending higher than taxes uh, in order to get out of the recession. Yeah, so they do that to, uh, they do that to, uh, to get out of recession. So under so under Kretchen and Martin, this was a this was where Kretchen and Martin were. So Kretchen they they had they had surpluses, so like government spending higher than taxes. Oh no, sorry. Uh, sorry. So um like they so taxes greater than government spending, so they they were saving money. So like saving, and then when Harper came in, he was prime minister for about nine years. Right here, the the first two years were surplus so taxes greater than government spending so there and then most of his prime ministership like due to the recession uh he ran deficits so like to get out of the recession, you had to run deficits. So that that was a big part of why there were deficits. And then, then twenty sixteen, there was a there was a balanced budget. However, that's disputed by a lot of economists. So. Then, so in this, so a lot of economies during 2016, they had a lot of uh, issues with fiscal. So, so like these economies, they all ran deficits. So United States, United Kingdom, United States, um, Japan, Canada, Spain. So they all ran deficits. So, and then Luxembourg, uh, Switzerland, Netherlands, they ran surpluses. So crowding out effects. 
expansionary fiscal policy may lead to higher interest rates, reduction in interest sensitive spending, may not be significant in a recession. Fiscal policy can be accommodated by increases in money supply. So like, yeah, we'll learn more about that. Like if you increase the money supply and increase government spending and reduce taxes, that's what they do to get the economy out of recession. So to get an economy out of a recession, increase government spending, reduce taxes and increase money supply. Yeah, so that, that you can do that. Um, however, you will run a deficit and will need to borrow from your central bank slash foreign investors slash domestic investors. And the problem is now if, so like a caveat here, if Bitcoin slash cryptocurrencies become the new medium of exchange for goods and services, increasing the money supply will not be an option for governments because the, the quantity of Bitcoin is fixed at 21 million Bitcoin and it will never grow. That's what they say. So that's going to really throw a wrench into governments because they won't be able to get out of the problems with increasing the money supply and borrowing, borrowing from their central bank. So this will throw a wrench into it and it completely change monetary policy. Uh, the central bank will not be able to reduce interest rates to support the economy with credit, with cheaper credit, cheaper interest payments. So yeah, it'll be, it'll take the government's money supply flexibility out of the economy, which will be a problem. So that's, that's, uh, that's going to change. That's going to completely change monetary policy. If, if Bitcoin cryptocurrencies become the, the standard for currency, the government will not have any power when it comes to money supply. So like all the mo monetary policy um, textbooks will have to be changed once Bitcoin, if Bitcoin does take over, cryptocurrencies take over. So yeah, uh, so in an open economy, since we have trade, when the 2009 housing crisis happened, 2008 housing crisis happened in the US, uh, when housing prices crashed, um, the Canadian economy was affected a lot by that because we do a lot of trade with the US. So if one, if the US economy goes into recession, we're gonna go into recession because the US is our greatest trading partner. So if they go into recession, we will go into recession. That's what happened in uh, 2008. So yeah, like so expansionary fiscal policy problem, recession, slow growth. We do expansionary fiscal policy, increase government spending, reduce uh, taxes, higher domestic interest rate, increase foreign demand for dollars, dollar appreciates, net exports decline, aggregate demand decreases, partially offsetting this expansionary fiscal policy. Contractionary fiscal policy problem inflation, contractionary fiscal policy, lower domestic interest rate, Decreased foreign demand for dollars, dollar depreciates, net exports increase, aggregate demand increases, partially offsetting the contractionary fiscal policy. So, yeah, budget surplus is annual amount by which government revenues exceed government expenditures. So, like 
So in that case, taxes, tax revenue is greater than government spending. And then budget deficit is annual amount by which our government expenditures exceed taxes. So government spending is greater than tax revenue. And then public debt is accumulation of all past deficits and surpluses. So about 80% of the total debt is held internally and 20% of the gross federal debt is held by foreigners. So 80%, um, uh, so that's like when they say internally, so internally means uh, like our lenders, our citizens, and the central bank. So a big thing that the government does is they, they, what the government does is they, they borrow from, so the government, so the Bank of Canada prints tens of billions of dollars. The Canadian government borrows from the Bank of Canada and pays the interest rate from the Bank of Canada. Um, official, so like officially, they are separate and the Bank of Canada is quasi independent of the government, but not really. They're basically the same thing. Just they have to be quasi independent because, because of uh, just so they got to seem the government has to seem like they're going to pay it back uh, for the for the Canadian dollar to have value. Because if 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 the government was just, you know, using the Bank of Canada as a proverbial piggy bank, the. The the dollar would be worthless basically because there would be no trust. They would just print hundreds of trillions of dollars from the Bank of Canada, and then there would be no value to the currency to the do to Canadian dollar anymore because there's just so much of it that uh, the value just drops like a rock. Because if there's so much of something, like if you know, for example, like, um, like, for example, if there's so much of something, like, if there's so much of something, the value goes away. Right, like if, if you can find it anywhere, there's no value. The only way something has value to it is is because it's rare or scarce. So, like for example, uh, like what what types of can you think of something that's rare or scarce? Yeah, uh, say in the chat if you can. Yeah, gold, exactly. That's great, Ethan. So yeah, gold. Gold is uh it's about two thousand dollars an ounce, right? Uh, that's a great that's a great one, Ethan. So two thousand dollars an ounce for gold, right? Um, it's rare because it's rare, right? If gold was as common as rocks, it would be worthless, right? Like you wouldn't pay you wouldn't you wouldn't pay anything for a rock like a general rock like you know like a rock you can find anywhere right cuz like it's everywhere there's no value to something that you can find anywhere right or gold you cannot find it's very rare to find gold like it's it's so it's so rare and that's the only way it has value right so like the same thing as Bitcoin. Bitcoin has 21 million in supply for Bitcoin, right? So it's rare and now it has a value 
of like 50,000 ish. So it's like that, like it has, um, it's scarce. It would be worthless if it had a supply of like, let's say, uh, so like, so like, let's say it had a supply of uh, like, Like, if it had a supply of, like, let's say, one, like, if the supply was like this, would be worthless. So, yeah. Like, if it had a supply of that, it would be worthless. Like, it would be worth nothing. The only reason, the only reason... Bitcoin has value is because of a, of scarcity, rareness, and limited supply. So yeah. So uh, over the years, uh, the Canadian debt has reduced um, up until about 1975, and then it increased. Uh, around nine, like over the 1980s to about 1995, and then went down ever since as a percentage of GDP. So like it went up to here, there was like a real debt crisis around this point. So like, that's why Martin came in uh, under Kretchen. Like Martin brought it down. Uh, yeah, he's he did a great job bringing that down. Uh, then, so like, uh, yeah, then like Mulroney's administration brought it up. The increasing the debt isn't, it's not always a bad thing. Like it's good to invest using, using board money. So that, that can be a good thing. And it was in a lot of cases under Mulroney, but too much debt can be a problem. Like it, it got up to too high over here. So like it was good. Like Martin and Kretschmann, they did a good job bringing down the debt. Uh, like they did a good job bringing down the debt. Uh, like yeah. So like there's there's uh it's good to have debt if you're gonna invest in good things like like infrastructure. Like that's a good thing. Or like roads and bridges. Like that's a great thing to invest in. That's good debt. Uh, but yeah, debt on 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 non infrastructure projects, like are is might not be a good thing in a lot of cases. So here, Canada has so Japan has a high amount of debt uh, as a percentage of GDP. So like these countries really struggle with debt, um, like more up here they really struggle with debt. But Canada is pretty low. Yeah. Uh, so like here, they're like, these countries are mostly fine. These are more in the middle, but Japan, Greece, and Italy are in real trouble with their debt. So, so this is uh, a good chart on debt. So Bank of Canada uh, lends 14% of the debt to the Canadian government. So like they lend, so like this is printed money lent to the Canadian government. Uh, public and charter banks, uh, so they, they uh, 50, lent 57% lent of money lent to the Canadian government is from banks. And then, and the non-residents, so like foreign, Foreign lenders contribute 29% of lend money to the Canadian. So there's a lot of concerns with debt, like 
bankruptcy refinancing taxation. And then Canada owes a substantial portion of its public debt to itself. That's that's the money that uh, that's what the government of that's what the Bank of Canada lends. So Bank of Canada lends. Yeah. So yeah, medium exchange is like, instead of bot bartering, you're using currency to trade. And then unit of account, we measure the value of goods and services in dollars, store value, possible acquire goods and services at a future date. So liquidity is the ease to uh, which we can convert an asset to cash with no purchasing power loss. So cash is fully liquid, is like the most liquid. So like most liquid, is cash and then like uh stocks stocks are like stocks are not stocks you can convert to cash but they aren't fully liquid yeah and then houses are less liquid than stocks because you need to sell it for cash. And then, so current money definition M1, currency, coins, plus paper money, demand deposits, institutions that offer demand deposits. So M2 is near money, is highly liquid financial assets that don't directly function as a medium of exchange. So like non-checkable savings accounts, like anything you have in a savings account uh, would be part of M2, term deposits, et cetera. So personal savings deposits, non-personal notice deposits, charter banks would be part of M2. M2 plus are deposits of trust and mortgage loan companies. And then money market mutual funds and M2 plus plus or Canada savings bonds and non-money market mutual funds. So yeah, like I was talking about before, what gives money value is accept acceptability, legal tender and relative scarcity. Yeah. So in this, this case, it shows these are the banks across the world. ICBC in China has the highest amount of assets. HSBC is second most. JP Morgan Chase is third most. BNP Paribas is fourth, and then so on. Uh, so yeah, the Canadian banks would be just below this, but they have a lot of assets like BMO, TD, RBC. Uh, Bank of Nova Scotia. They're not on this. They're not high up on this list, but they're they're getting there. Yeah. And then, uh, trust companies, loan companies, credit unions, and Cassie Populaire are uh, are lower in that list. So. The money, the monetary system works, the banking system works through like you, you deposit money, then the bank lends out that money, and if you want to withdraw money, the bank has to borrow from another bank for withdrawal requests in the overnight market. However, if the other banks don't have 
any cash on hand because it's lent out. Uh, the bank can borrow from the central bank for withdrawals. So that's how it works. And then, so that's why, that's why, like, this is why uh, you cannot withdraw. This is why, like, millions of people at a time cannot withdraw all of their money because they, because the bank doesn't have it. They already went it out. And they cannot borrow enough or fast or as fast as they need from other banks or the bank or the central bank to fund deposits. So this is what's happening in Russia. It's called a bank run. The bank cannot get the cash back. So people are unable to withdraw their money. Yeah. So this is what happened in the US in 2008. The, the, the banks were lending money to borrowers that couldn't pay it back. And then this led to massive problems with underwater homeowners. So like they, the value of the house is lower than the mortgage value. So like, uh, so like, let's say the value of the house was 300,000 and the mortgage was 400,000. So the people walked away from the mortgage and, and the banks went bankrupt. Some of the banks went bankrupt. Because the they were not getting payments from the homeowner. So uh, back back uh, in like the mid 1900s to before, they used to back every currency, the U.S. dollars by gold. So it was kind of like it was kind of like the tether coins that they used in crypto. Like they backed it with like real gold. So so money actually had value back then, but then they got rid of it. Um, then they just they started printing money like no one's watching without it being backed by any sort of asset. So government securities, bond purchased from the public by the 